Hi there, I'm Jeremy Krug, and in this video we're going to take a look at AP Chemistry Unit 9, Section 7, which is an introduction to electrochemistry. If you haven't already subscribed, go ahead and consider doing that. And if you learned something from my video, go ahead and slam that like button. I would really appreciate it. That really does help the algorithm. Well, as we take a look at electrochemistry, electrochemistry is just the practical application of redox reactions. Now, way back in Unit 4, we talked about redox. This is basically just where one species is gaining electrons, another one is losing electrons. Let's take a look at an example here. Let's say we have a piece of iron that is added to a solution of copper to sulfate. Well, first thing we have to do is recognize that the sulfate ion is not doing anything. That's a spectator ion because in most of these redox reactions a metal is reacting with metal ions. So it's the iron and the copper two ions that are the reactants. Now what are the products going to be? Well the metals normally get oxidized, don't they, into metallic ions. So iron is going to become iron two plus. And the metallic ions normally get reduced down into a metal. So the copper two plus is going to become copper metal. Now we have to balance these. We see that there's a charge of zero on the left on this first half reaction and a plus two over here. So to balance this out we need two electrons on the right side and then likewise to balance out the charge on the second half reaction we need two electrons on the left side right there. So now we can take these two half reactions and add them together. We realize that the first one is oxidation because we are losing electrons and the second one is reduction because we're gaining electrons. You might remember from unit four we said Leo the lion goes ger, right? Lose electrons oxidation and then the GER, G-E-R, gain electrons is reduction. Or if you prefer, uh, if that's uh, not sophisticated enough, then you can think of oil rig, O-I-L, oxidation is losing, rig, R-I-G, reduction is gaining. So now we can take these two half reactions and add them together, and you get the overall balanced redox reaction. So we have iron solid and copper two aqueous ions yield iron two ions aqueous and copper metal solid. Now let's imagine what this might look like on a microscopic or a submicroscopic scale. Let's imagine that we have a piece of iron metal. There's our iron solid. It's in this nice electrode or piece of iron of some type. And then we have copper ions. Those are in aqueous solution. That means that they're swimming around in water. and Every one of these iron atoms would be a little bit more stable if it could lose a couple of electrons. And likewise, the copper two ions, those are, are fairly stable, but as it turns out, iron is more active, which means iron would be a lot better at giving its electrons away than iron would. So what's going to happen? Well, basically something like this. And so essentially you can see that some of these metals and metal ions have essentially swapped places in the electrode in the solution. For example, these copper atoms here, they used to be in solution. They were swimming around, weren't they? Well, what happens is that this metal has just stolen electrons from iron. And so because of that, it's now imprisoned in the solid state. And so it is locked up as part of that solid electrode right there. And likewise, the iron metal just gave its electrons back. So it gets to be free and swimming around in the aqueous state. And so as you can see, the copper and the iron basically just swapped uh, states there. Now, these forces, the tendency of these particles to, to transfer these electrons is very great. In fact, it is so great that we can actually harness this force and push those electrons through a wire. And so here I have the same reaction, except I've set it up in two electrodes, where on one side we have iron, on the other side we have the copper. And one half reaction is taking place over here on the left side, 
and one of the half reactions has taken place on the other side. So what I mean is we have basically created a battery. And in chemistry, we call this a galvanic cell, but that's basically just a battery. We have basically uh, harnessed these, these half reactions here. And what happens is these electrons, when they are transferred, they're actually transferred through this wire right here. And so we can pass this wire through something like a light bulb or a cell phone or a voltmeter or something like that, a radio, you know, something like that, a flashlight, and we can actually harness that electricity. We can power some sort of a load. So what's happening? Well, let's take a closer look at this galvanic cell. Now on the left side where this iron is, that's where the iron half reaction is taking place. The iron is turning into iron two plus ions and two electrons. That's the same half reaction that we just wrote a minute ago. Now on the other side, where the copper electrode is located, that's where the copper half reaction is taking place. The copper two plus gains the two electrons, making it into copper. So what we have here is basically two half reactions. Now this half reaction, in fact every half reaction, has a voltage associated with it. So for example, this iron half reaction has a voltage of plus 0 0.44 volts. And this half reaction, the copper being reduced, has a voltage of positive 0.34 volts. So if you want to know the total overall voltage of the battery, we just have to add these two together. And so the total cell potential, or the total voltage that's going through the wire here, is 0.78 volts. Now if you had some sort of a voltmeter, you could plug this in and it would actually show up like this on the actual digital readout. So 0.78 volts. And that's a voltage that you can use to, you know, to, to run some sort of a load, like a, a light bulb or a radio or something like that, a calculator maybe. And so, yes, we have a potential difference of 0.78 volts. Now I want you to notice that over here we have oxidation. We have the metal being oxidized into metal ions. On the other side here, where the copper is located, we have reduction. The copper ions are being reduced down into copper metal. Now in chemistry, when we have a galvanic cell, we give these a name. This electrode over here, where the oxidation is taking place, is called the anode. That's just what it's called. There, that is just a, a name for that. Oxidation takes place at the anode. And likewise, over here, this electrode where reduction is taking place is called the cathode. And once again, that's just the name of it. Reduction takes place at the cathode. And you have to know that. And there are perhaps some uh, mnemonic aids that people use. Uh, a very common one that I show my students is you can think of a red cat and an ox. And so if you think of a red cat and an ox, you'll realize that reduction takes place at the cathode and the anode is where oxidation takes place. So uh, that is a nice little nifty mnemonic aid. If you want something that's a little bit more sophisticated, you might think that the words oxidation and anode both start with vowels and reduction and cathode both start with consonants. So you can do that too. It kind of works the same way. Now when we think about the actual electricity that's moving through the wire, the electrons are always going to move from the anode to the cathode through the wire. So this, this is the anode, this, this iron electrode. So that means that they're moving from the anode to the cathode, which is the copper side. So I'm going to draw that in here. That is the movement of electrons through the wire. If you forget that, then think of the AC or the air conditioning. It goes from anode to cathode. That's how electrons move. Now as you were to watch, if you were to watch this, this battery or this galvanic cell run, what would you see? 
Well, if you look at the overall balanced equation, or even just these two half reactions, you'll see that the iron is going to be essentially uh, dissolving or, or, or corroding, if you want to say that, into iron two ions. And so as time goes on, this iron is going to be slowly eaten away. Actually, the solid iron uh, anode is going to lose weight. Over here, on the other hand, the cathode is going to gain weight because we are producing copper as a product. So we would expect to see, whoops, we would expect to see this copper start to get larger. So you can imagine like a mass of copper being deposited out. And so the copper, the cathode, increases in mass if it's a solid cathode. Whereas the solid anode is going to decrease in mass. Or if you want a mnemonic aid for that, the cat gets fat. Or, or in other words, the cathode gains weight. It gets fat, if you want to say that. So let's focus on this salt bridge. So you might notice that we have this salt bridge here that we haven't said anything about. The salt bridge is necessary for this galvanic cell to run. If you don't put the salt bridge in there, you're not going to have a voltage. You're not going to have a circuit. Now, why is the salt bridge there? Well, it's not really there to complete the circuit. That's not really what's happening here. The salt bridge is allowing a transfer of ions. It's allowing a transfer of ions. And so if we look at what we have back here, notice that the iron is turning into iron 2 plus. And so we are producing iron 2 plus ions into this solution. Well, you can't just produce cations and just not have anything else to go along with it. Because then, this side gets very positive and it you end up getting electrocuted, I suppose. Or the same thing over here. This side gets uh, the opposite. You know, if this side gets more positive, this side would get more negative. So in order to balance that out, the salt bridge helps keep the charges all balanced. And so what happens is we put some sort of inert uh, salt or ionic compound in that salt bridge with some sort of a gel probably. and the anions, notice what happens there, that anion is going to gravitate toward the anode. That kind of makes sense though. Anions travel toward the anode. And notice what happens to this sodium ion here, which is a cation. It does this. The cations are going to travel toward the cathode. That makes sense too, doesn't it? Cations go toward the cathode through the salt bridge. Now, like I said, the ions in that salt bridge should be inert. That means they are, they are things that are not going to react with the other ions in these two uh, beakers or solutions over here. If you don't do that, you're going to have some sort of a precipitate or some sort of a gunk that's formed in one or both of your beakers. I've seen that happen and it messes up your results and so you don't want to do that. So let's just summarize what we have about galvanic cells here before we move on to the next part of this. Reduction takes place at the cathode. Oxidation takes place at the anode. Or if you want a nice mnemonic aid, red cat and an ox. Electrons travel through the wire from the anode to the cathode. Think about the AC. The cathode increases in mass. The cat gets fat. From the salt bridge, anions travel toward the anode and cations travel toward the cathode. And one last little detail here that I want to share with you. Galvanic cells are always thermodynamically favored. That means if you have a battery and you stick it into a flashlight or a, a radio or something, it should just work. You shouldn't have to do something to the battery to make it to work. It should, it, it should work just uh, pretty much spontaneously. Well, in our next video, we're going to learn how we get these voltage values and how we can calculate the potential difference in a galvanic cell. I hope to see you then.